as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. Would, would you like to go take a bike ride? <laughs> Looks like Chris is getting on. Okay, and I think we are live on YouTube now. Let me get us live on the same website. Dr. Laura, you said you, you're live streaming now? Yeah, we're live streaming now, and I'm just working on the city website part of it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I think it's coming in. Hi, Brett. Can you hear me? This is Ethan. Hi, Ethan. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you are loud and clear. Cool. Let's see. Chris, can you hear us okay? Yes. Awesome. Yes, I can. Chris, I stole your idea for Chipotle for dinner. Oh, and how was it? It was, it was very good. That was good stuff. Excellent. How many people were in there waiting, though? Oh, we do DoorDash. So oh, do you? Okay, well. Yeah. So just one. <laughs> Did, were there a lot of people waiting at your place? No, when I went, it was I was the only one in there, so. Oh, me. Yeah. Yes. Good evening, Britt. Good evening, Chris. How are you? Doing well, you? Doing good. Well, be okay, it looks like we are discussion. live on the website as well. Great. going on here hey guys Hello. hi mike How are you? good evening mike there i am so can anybody hear me this is earl hi earl how are you oh, i'm yeah. good but i don't i evidently don't have my mic my i don't have the not mic but the, the camera on how do i what's going on here oh start start video get rid of that maybe that'll be yeah down there Tap on. There we go. There we right. go. Now we're in business. That's it. Earl, how you hold up? Holding up well. And yeah. uh, my, uh, as you can see, I've uh, just recently been able to get a haircut, and my family said, "Boy, you're like a hundred pounds lighter with with uh, <laughs> hair off the side of your head." It's a beautiful thing. It is. Where'd you get a haircut, Earl? At Floyd's. I need to get one too. In, uh, in South Glen, at Floyd's. Yeah, I was one of the first ones in, so it worked out well. <laughs> How many people were in there when you got your haircut? They only allow uh, five at a time. Uh, so there's only five barbers and they only allow five people in and you wait outside to get your temperature taken. They make sure you have a mask and you wait outside until your barber uh, calls you in and, um, you know, it's, you feel pretty safe doing it. I mean, you feel pretty, pretty sure, but I also look around and I go, I'm not sure how these, how this is going to make these guys much money, but um, yeah, you got to start somewhere. So. Mm -hmm. It'll at least put a little uh, paycheck in the, the, those five barbers pockets, at least. Yeah. I don't know about Floyd's, but. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Exactly. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. So we have four of four four commissioners on right now. Yes. Yeah, we're waiting on 
Bill Lucas, Jennifer Miller, and David Wyman. Hello, this is Dory Kaplan. Hi, Dory. Hi, Dory. Hi, everybody. Good evening, Dory. I'm not sure if you guys all heard, but City Hall is actually back open again. I did. I heard that. I got the, yeah. got, the got a text message saying that that was the case. Still have to have a mask to come in. So. And limited to ten people. It, it, in a space, yeah. Yeah. So. So it's been interesting to go back this week, well, this week for two days. So, um, on that note, Laura, uh, this is Kathy. Um, I, I did get your email, and I don't want to go in there. I got to go by and sign some things, but I don't want to go in when other people are there. So, is there a good time this week? I'm pretty flexible. A time when other people aren't in there for for me to come in and sign that. I mean, or is, does it really matter? I mean, um, do you want it? Do you want to sneak in like before hours or after hours? Whatever works for you. I can be very flexible. So, um, why don't you just have a call tomorrow at nine? I can come in before then if that works for you, or I can come in tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, either one of those. I'm fine. Either way. Okay. Um, why don't I? Is three o'clock too well, like uh, three thirty too late? No, that's fine. Okay, let's do that. It should be later in the okay. day. Be around. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> Somebody asked me an interesting uh, question today. They said, uh, you know, once we get to the point where, you know, council meetings, commission meetings, etc., start to take place back in uh, back in city in the uh, in the in the chambers but kind of a bit of social distancing and how will that work and they said would they change would they rebuild the dais and i said no i said i said i suspect that they probably just space people out and have some of the commissioners coming down where staff sits and staff will end up being sitting out at tables probably out in the out in the middle of the room huh I said is it, have you guys started thinking about that yeah, we're talking about the June 2nd meeting possibly being in person. And the idea um, right now is that we would spread out council along the dais and the staff tables. And then we would set up other tables going kind of into the audience for staff to sit at, you know, based around. And then um, we we have the, the room set up right now with very few chairs um, for court where we only allow 10 people in at a session. So we'll probably have some situation like that. Um, knock on wood, we don't have any controversial issues. I'm not sure what we would do if we had a whole bunch of people wanting to attend in person. We might have to rethink that in that situation, but. Right. Well, that's what I figured you'd do, so it makes sense. Yeah. And hopefully having the, you know, the stream going on the website and on YouTube means that people can can watch and know what's going on without coming in person unless they really have something they, they think they want to say. Sure, absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna bow out for a second and text Jim to see. Ethan, I'm gonna text Jim. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then uh, Mr. Fitch was with you, correct? Uh, yeah, he's with Rick Engineering. Yeah, yep. You don't have to be wrong. Bill Lucas has joined us with his mic off. Hello, Bill. There he is. Yeah, sorry, you told me to keep my mic off. I should be seen. <laughs> not heard. Um, you I can didn't... have it on to say hello to everybody and then turn it off. Gotcha. <laughs> 
Okay, I think everybody's here, so we'll go ahead and start the meeting three minutes early. Uh, I think we're actually waiting on Commissioner Miller. Oh, is she not here? I thought I saw her name there. Okay, we'll wait till she joins or 6.30. I am going to start the recording, though, uh, so everybody's there. Commissioner Wyman, your mic is off. Maybe you want it that way. Can you hear me, Commissioner Kaplan? I yes. can hear you. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Good. What are you drinking, Bill? I am uh, enjoying a um, cock and bull ginger beer. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, very spicy. <laughs> Refreshing. <laughs> Highly recommend it. Did you send us all one to have as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good with a little rum sometimes, too. Dark and well, stormy. No idea. Yeah. Yeah, no fur. <clears throat> Kathy, I feel like I'm getting to know that poster very well behind you. I know. <laughs> Funny. I've, I've seen that one a lot. I know. It's the best um spot in my little yeah. In my little world here. This yes. is work in. I sew masks in. I work out in. <laughs> and I and I meet people. It's just every I have a, a big window that would backlight me in pretty much any other place. So yeah. I don't want to inflict that on anybody else. Yeah, Ethan, got some nice, you know, guest bedroom art there too, Chris. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> Looks like a Hyatt room. But. Um, Ethan, should we maybe reach out to her? Yeah, that is what I am doing as we speak. So I'm hoping that she is looking at her email. Okay. Uh, if not, I will give her a call. If you have her number, you could, I can call her as well if you're emailing. Okay. And just uh, we are live streaming, so no. Yeah, maybe no text it to me. Yeah. There, there, you go. there we go. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and start if that's okay with you guys? Sure. That's fine. <clears throat> it is 6 30. I'll call the meeting to order. Ethan has sent me a script, so all I have to do is read it. <laughs> <laughs> the May 12, 2020 study session of the Cherry Hills Village Planning and Zoning Commission will now come to order at 6.31 p.m. In conformance with city regulations, the city manager's disaster declaration and the governor's safety at home order, we are conducting this study session virtually. Item number two, roll call of members. Commissioner Holland. Here. Commissioner Kaplan. Present. Commissioner LaMare. Present. Commissioner Lucas. Present. Commissioner Miles. Present. Commissioner Miller. Commissioner Wyman. Is he, is he still I'm, muted? Uh, I'm, it uh, looks like he's here. Uh, now. 
There he is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. So this evening, we're, it's basically an open discussion regarding the community survey for the Cherry Hills Village Master Plan. And thanks to staff for organizing material and sending it out. And we have a nice outline that we can follow. And I think we were contemplating, Chris, turning it over to Britt. Uh, do you have any comments uh, to start with or should we just go ahead with Britt? Yeah, let me just uh, say a couple of things real quick. Um, sure. we, we wanted to provide a little bit of, um, of a, some ideas or options just to get the conversation really started tonight, but this is in, in no way uh, intended to limit or, or decide what the, should happen with the survey. This is, this is just a tool to help you guys um, facilitate the conversation really more than anything. Um, you know, the second thing I'll say where we got this list um, was really, it was a combination of a little bit from the last survey done in 2008 uh, we also took uh, the, the input from city council and from you all um, at the previous study sessions about key topics that needed to be explored. Um, and then we also looked a little bit at, you know, what some of the things that were in the RFP to make sure that we were not forgetting anything there. So that's where these ideas came from. But again, you know, if, if uh, it, it, this really is your, your survey, so um, you know, I would turn it over to Britt and let him kind of walk through some of these, but make no mistake, if you guys want to add a completely new topic or even category of topics, by all means, um, you know, one of the things we'll want to talk about maybe at the end is what role, if any, you would like the Citizens Advisory Task Force to have in the survey itself. Do you want to get, hear their feedback on it or... Uh, in an effort of timeliness, would you rather sort of move faster? So that may involve questions from you guys to us about, you know, how soon can we start meeting in person? And, uh, you know, uh, we can talk a little bit about that at that time, but that would be how I'd set the table for tonight. So uh, Chairman, if you, you know, if, if, if you have anything else, great. Otherwise I would suggest we turn it over to Britt to kind of walk us through the list uh, that was included in the packet. I think that sounds great. One other, one other, uh, one other uh, question. In addition, when you said, "Hey, topics are open," we're talking about topics, which is all great, and I figured we'd do that. But then, in addition, sometime after, presumably not tonight, the wording of questions probably will yes. be a topic as well, but not for tonight, right? Yes, tonight is, uh, and based on on uh, the commission's direction from last time, you know, this was more of a dis dis study session discussion really to try and help provide guidance to narrow down the work right. Right. so that so that we could begin working on wording to provide to you. And that will probably be a little bit more of a formal discussion. You may even vote on, on uh, survey questions that you'd like to see in there. Right. Um, okay. So to, that's why tonight is really more of a study session, a d discussion. You know, what do we want to make sure we hit? <clears throat> Britt will get into this a little bit, but you know, we're going to want to make sure that this survey is not too long as well. Uh, you know, there's a law of diminishing returns. If they're too long, folks won't respond. <clears throat> so we, we've got to try and find that uh, nice spot where we get all the great information that I know we all want, but not go so far that, uh, you know, we start making it difficult for people to fill one out. So. Terrific. Okay, good. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Chris and I talked a little bit about how long we thought tonight's meeting should or needed to go. And we thought maybe 45 minutes to an hour. I think we can go as long as anybody feels we need to uh, go this evening, but any comments on, on that topic before we get started? Not for me. <laughs> Okay, very good. Well, Britt, we'll turn it over to you then. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Britt Bombrey from Rec Community Planning. Good to see you all again and uh, to be in contact here on Zoom this evening. We had a good discussion last back in April about uh, general direction and schedule for the master plan update. And really one of the first activities out of the gate that we talked about was this community survey. And of course, you had a survey last time 
Uh, the surveys are very important uh, given the kind of situation we're in where in-person meetings may not occur for a bit until, you know, later in the summer, fall, I think it's really to be determined. This is potentially one of the most important aspects of the plan up front. And so we want to get these questions right, make sure they, as Chris alluded to, go deep enough to get really great data, uh, but also not to get too much in the weeds, so to speak. And really, um, you know, Chris mentioned some of the things that flavored these topics here. The previous survey was a starting point. Again, comments from the Planning Commission and Planning Zoning Commission and the City Council back in February, but also the RFP and just uh, also it's influenced by things we've seen just kind of studying the community the last couple of months here as part of the existing conditions analysis and just uh, overall flavor of what we see in the community. So Ethan, I'll share my screen, right? Yeah, go for it. Okay, just gotta find the right thing here. Oh, there we and go to the top. Okay, can everyone see that? No. Uh, yes. I can see. Of course, I don't see Brit on yeah. video either, so I don't know what's going on. That's because I'm sharing my screen with the PowerPoint to walk us through the topics and so forth. I don't yeah, see I, either. And I can see your topics, but I never did see you, Brett, which I just didn't know if you had your, your, your camera. Yeah, I, but I the see camera's it. not on here. I figured okay. we're going through the PowerPoint. So can you all see the, the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Yes. Good day. No, you no, can't. No, but we'll go ahead. Okay. Well, Commissioner, just, just as a heads up, um, don't fear not the packet information that you received is a close mirror to what is on the PowerPoint. So you're not really think, like missing out on it. I, I figured as much. Yeah. So proceed. Thanks. Okay. So some key points here and uh, we can go through these and have a discussion as you all like. Um, you know, up front with the project, uh, we had discussions with city staff about how this survey could be conducted. I think it's really open for discussion. It could be done by mail, you know, mailing out surveys to everyone in the community. Uh, it could be done online alternatively. Uh, with mail surveys, there's some cost involved in terms of postage, obviously, but uh, in the case of mail, you actually ensure that you uh, send a survey to every single recipient in the community. There's less effort to make sure that people receive it. Uh, with online, there's a little more work to get uh, information, make sure it's shared around the community. But so there's trade-offs between those two choices in terms of cost, but also, um, you know, just kind of the style of the community. And so your input tonight concerning which way to go on that may also be instructive. Chris alluded to the ideal length or the, the kind of the Goldilocks level of questions. There's really no magic number. Um, over the years, I've seen anywhere up to 25 questions for an initial community survey. Um, the general range is typically 15 to 20 questions. If you get fewer than a dozen, you're really, in most cases, most communities are not hitting enough topics deeply enough for initial survey. Um, but if you get over 20, people start to glaze over. It just becomes too overwhelming for people in terms of the volume of questions. Now, in terms of the big picture here, uh, let's kind of speak broadly to the screen here. This initial community survey is, of course, uh, informative to identify uh, the key issues the community sees for the master plan update, uh, kind of tease out some initial ideas about opportunities for ideas to explore as part of the master plan update, and really just kind of, uh, it's a bit of a diagnostic to a certain extent of where we are as a community in terms of existing conditions. But importantly, it's not a, you know, a quality survey. It's not a quality of life survey. It's not one of these surveys you'll see many communities do that are kind of done on an annual basis to, you know, assess the performance of their streets department or public works on really just the nuts and bolts performance aspects of a community. Um, this is really intended to gather the big picture vision questions for regards community, where we're going, opportunities, things like that. Importantly, any survey should have demographic questions for reference and analysis that allows for some cross-referencing. So we can find out, for example, uh, how different age groups are selecting options for questions, uh, gender. Uh, there's various ways to slice and dice that in terms of geography, even in terms of certain parts of the community could be a question about that. Uh, importantly, 
with uh, the central survey, really kind of going back to our initial kickoff discussions with city staff, there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, how character will become a prominent issue in the master plan update. That's at least how we anticipate it may go. And so in that realm, uh, having pictures and graphics that would accompany the questions in the community survey would be useful. One, it makes the uh, survey more attractive, whether it's in the mail or online. And to some extent, uh, both for initial surveys and for follow-on surveys, you're able to show examples of what we're talking about in terms of what do we mean by this kind of character or that kind of character, or what do we mean by a certain multimodal uh, strategy or another one, right? So it allows for a bit, bit better illustration. The last survey from 2008, I have it in front of, here, in front of me here on my desk, you know, it's very voluminous, very, very uh, thorough, but there's really no graphics whatsoever. It's all, it's all tape and so forth. So the graphics aspect should increase the marketability of the survey and also just make it more interesting and useful for the community. So as mentioned, this is the initial community survey. Our overall scope of work and our plan for the master plan update, and this follows a typical um, kind of progression for many uh, community plan efforts. Often we have an initial survey that is kind of diagnostic like this, but we will very often have a second or third survey. In this case, as the bullet point indicates, a second survey, um, you know, perhaps midway through the process, might evaluate people's uh, input on some key choices on various mm -hmm. planning aspects, be it uh, trails or parks or that the other. Um, often that second survey is kind of a very key one to kind of tease out what people think about some very key choices. And the third one, that's where we want to get some, hopefully some consensus around a community concerning the preferred direction for the main components of a master plan update. You know, in many communities, uh, these discussions about alternative concepts and preferred direction are very heavy on land use, right? For a greenfield community on the outskirts of a metropolitan area, that's very important. In the case of Cherry Hills Village, these key choices, these concepts that we're going to be talking about throughout the process are going to be most likely of a different flavor, as we mentioned, character, parks, other aspects. And really, tonight's discussion will start to set the stage for some of the key topics, really not only for the survey, but some of the main aspects that are going to feed into the overall master plan update. Any questions on this initially? Okay. So, <clears throat> We'll just dive into topic by topic. You've seen this outline, I imagine, um, hopefully most of you had a chance to, to thumb through that outline here. And again, we're not going through question by question tonight. We're really trying to go through the topic area. So, you know, we can stop along the way and talk on each subject, or if you'd like, we can keep rolling through the overall outline and come back. Um, this first topic, multimodal transportation, that's uh, being led by FHU of our team. We knew from the outset cut through traffic was a key issue. It was a key issue back in 2008. We anticipate it will be again in the community survey, both initial surveys plus ideas for dealing with it down the line. Uh, the idea of uh, addressing or having a question about traffic congestion on the premier streets like uh, Hamden, Bellevue, um, even streets like uh, Clarkson and Happy Canyon and so forth may be key questions. Uh, questions that assess people's views about uh, uh, the current state of the community for bicycle facilities, movement and safety, you know, how safe is it for people to bicycle around Cherry Hills Village, how easy is it, things like that. Same thing with pedestrian safety and movement uh, in terms of sidewalks, trails, how do people assess where we are now and um, what are some major thoughts people might have with, in regards to that. And then finally, access to transit, and we said here of various forms, so we're not necessarily talking about RTD buses that go around Repo County and into Denver and so forth. Could also be questions about uh, transit services geared to seniors or you know, transit on demand or people call for transit service. It's a question really to kind of assess the big picture nature of what transit issues people see in the community, what transit they might want to uh, look into as the master plan update progresses. Okay, parks and open space. You know, we've, uh, Begun the assessment, obviously, of the parks and open space system in Cherry Hills Village, a lot of great parks there, uh, a lot of great amenities and natural features in them. Um, we thought a question assessing people's view of the quality of the parks and open spaces and also perhaps some initial, you know, ideas and for things to at least look into in terms of improvements that may be desired in parks and open spaces would be a good idea for the initial survey. 
Same thing with access and connectivity to parks and open spaces. How well do people uh, assess the ability to walk or bike from where they live or where they do their activities <clears throat> down to local parks and open spaces? That's a question that may be very key here. Um, same thing with quality of trails. You know, there's the Highline Canal Trail, which is the very key trail through the heart of uh, Cherry Hills Village, but also uh, other trails around the community. Um, how do people assess Cherry Hills Village right now in terms of trails for biking, for pedestrians, but also for equestrian movement? It's a very key aspect here in Cherry Hills Village. So moving on to community character. Mentioned before, that. I, before I, hey, Brett, before you do one thing, I don't yes. know, because you want us to kind of chime in as we go through the go through this? Or did you? Yeah, or, totally. Or it's up could, to you. I think we, I would suggest we go through it kind of quickly and then come back. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, uh, it's fine. So community character, as mentioned, we anticipate this will be a fairly significant topic here for the master plan update. So what does that really mean? We tried to break it down into subparts here to really try to focus the discussion really for the survey and as we get into the meat of the comfort or the up master plan update. First, the character of local and collector streets. How do people assess that character in general for the local collector streets? Uh, the visual character and identity of community gateways and entrances. We have, for example, here on the screen, the, that's the uh, welcome sign on Quincy as you head east from uh, Clarkson, right? And there's other entrances like that around Cherry Hills Village, but people, how do people assess that visual character as they come into Cherry Hills Village? Are there any uh, inputs to the initial survey concerning the identity? Is Cherry Hills Village clearly defined when you come in or do people even really uh, worry about that. There could be an option, for example, in a survey question where uh, folks like it to be very understated in terms of how you enter Cherry Hills Village. Those are some of the details you get into later in the process, but we wanted to assess people's views of the character coming in. Uh, related to community character is really, you know, character is the visual stuff like the entrances, the trees, the uh, quality streetscape, but it's also the built environment, right? And built environment translates into topics of land use. We don't have a category here tonight for discussion of land use per se, but housing and, and having different housing types and choices is perhaps a theme that could come through the master plan update. So here we thought there could be a general topic or a question related to, you know, should there be different housing types or more housing types integrated into the community character in the future? And it's got to do with the city staff, you know, and really it's in terms of the demographics of the region and the population overall in the, in the area in Cherry Hills Village, senior housing, different types of senior housing choices could be something to explore here in the master plan update. And then that fourth bullet is actually tied pretty closely, almost directly actually, to a question out of the 2008 survey. There was a question in that survey about people's openness to uh, altering regulations to manage character. It's kind of the big picture assessment of, you know, how deeply should we delve into this character topic from a city management perspective, right? So that's um, that's an interesting bullet point there. Okay. Sustainability, this uh, goes back to the RFP, um, pretty directly actually this topic area here. Perceptions and views of more energy efficient and sustainable policies and standards. So here's some example images from other communities, you know, solar panels, obviously, uh, ways to treat stormwater, uh, renewable energy. I think getting people's uh, views of the importance of this for the Natural Planet Update will be fairly important. And it's a topic that came through the initial planning for this study, this Natural Planet Update, and we want to get some initial question or two related to that here in the survey. That's, at least that's our thought. We'll see what you all think tonight. Uh, planning for aging populations. You hear a lot about that in the media, um, have for many several years now around community plans here in, in the Denver area and nationwide. So you know, planning for aging population means you know, people think about uh, independent living or senior housing communities, but uh, the topic that most planners refer to um, is the continuum of care, which, meaning providing services, housing and associated services for seniors as they move through the progression of aging, because it's not just one state. As you go from 65 up to 75, 85 and beyond, your needs change for housing and various other things. So this question relates a little bit back to the character topic, but the question in general is, should we have more senior units 
or have more of a focus on that continuum of care in Cherry Hills Village, or it could be a topic that kind of ties with how Cherry Hills Village relates to services and uh, availability of these um, um, assets elsewhere in Rapo County or in the south part of the Denver Metro. Related to that, there is a topic here that could be explored through the master plan update of whether the city itself as village should provide more senior services or actual senior facilities, a se more of a senior center or enhanced uh, senior uh, <laughs> gathering places, things like that. It's just a question at the outset. People may say yay or nay, delve into that further as part of this master plan update or not. Community facilities. <clears throat> There's an um, important topic here that came, um, came really out of the RFP and also discussions with the city staff. The perceptions and views of public safety and crime in Cherry Hills Village, and really what that means. Um, the topic of burglaries has come up in some of the discussions in the past, uh, and, that, and that might relate to the master plan update. Uh, the drainage topic, that relates to citywide drainage improvements, perhaps, and also uh, it's very important to, um, as we go through the survey, perhaps to delve into the topic of how the Highland Canal changes may impact drainage here in the community as well. So this topic may be a part of the first survey or you know, we could decide to have it be later the second or third survey. Key issues for stormwater management, stormwater quality. Um, that's an important issue to think about you know, community wide. And importantly, when you think about these items, it's important to, as we get into a survey, perhaps think about people's views of how to fund these improvements because a lot of people will say, sure, yes, let's do all that. But when the sticking point is really how you fund it uh, through the community or through different uh, organizations. And then the general topic of any additional community facilities to be considered. So are there, we have a new city hall, we have a new police station, a new park is being constructed right there around the city hall. Um, with our facilities, you know, again, this plan is intended to be long-term, 10 years, 20 years out. And mm -hmm. often, you know, ambitious or long-term goals. Are there some facilities that we wanna put on the radar uh, for this master plan update and for the overall master plan discussion going forward um, in the future. Economics, um, the topic of economics is often, I'd say more prominent in other communities where again, they have a greenfield situation, a lot of unplanned land or a lot of development still to occur or a smaller community that's emerging into a suburb or trying to grow larger and larger. The topic of economics, how to fund operations, how to provide more services for a really larger and larger population becomes more important. Um, the topic of economics really back in 2008, that survey talked a little bit more in the detail about, you know, should the city provide different, explore different funding options for X, Y, and Z, different options. Um, we think there's a general topic here to perhaps explore the idea of changes in the funding strategies for the city. You know, should they, should the revenue mix be changed somewhat? Uh, are there outside sources to really pursue more strongly? Again, this could come into the initial survey or it could be more of an implementation topic down the line here as we go through the process. And then finally, a catch all of uh, just other topics here. Exterior lighting in Cherry Hills Village. It's important to think about the uh, views of current conditions, including dark skies. So what's the quality of lighting? How well is it protecting for dark skies and controlling light pollution and so forth? And then really people's uh, general input on the support for city regulation, the city code pertaining to lighting, getting a general sense up front of how well the city is managing the lighting issue through its processes. And then finally, the topic which often comes up in discussions in this community and many others is the potential undergrounding of utility lines and people's enthusiasm for exploring that topic further. But um, whether it's in this survey or down the line, it's also important to infuse the, the, uh, the trade-off here. There's associated cost with that aspect, as maybe you know. Uh, it's not like you could just order up utility line bearing for an entire community. It's really a, a very complicated issue with a lot of cost and requires a good deal of careful thinking. So again, towards the end of this meeting, I anticipate, as Chris alluded to, we'll talk about uh, to what degree the CAT should be involved in really going through the draft set of questions, which is really, again, the next step in the process, um, or whether it's going to be more of a planning zoning commission um, duty here. And again, out of this meeting tonight, we'll be working on our draft set of survey questions with city staff here the next few weeks. 
And then finally, by the time we end the evening, it'd be good to talk about our timing for when that uh, next <clears> meeting would be to review questions or just the, the process here the next month or two and getting the survey uh, up and going uh, as we start the master plan update and really going out to hear initial input from the community. I uh, also mentioned, I failed to mention it up front, uh, Rob Fitch, our office manager for our, from our Centennial office is on the phone. I don't think his camera's on. He's just going to be listening into the conversation to assist me in uh, making sure we capture everything from the conversation tonight. So with that, I'm just page back to the uh, first topic, Chair uh, Lemaire. Yes. Um, voices, floor is yours. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, uh, so why don't we start at the beginning and have people make comments as we go along. Um, first is multimodal transportation. I had one comment there and it's sort of woven through your, your list, but my question is, or, or topic is, should we look at existing right of way in a multi-use uh, manner where we can consider walking trails, bike trails, equestrian trails, and automotive. Uh, so we're looking at the public realm within the right-of-way and, and how many different types of uses we can get in that right-of-way, depending on what's appropriate. Quincy uh, comes to mind for horseback riding, bicycles, and cars. So I wondered if that might be a topic of its own. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes that makes sense as a subset here under multimodal transportation. Um, and that's a good way to think about it and engaging with communities in terms of really looking at the real estate, the, the width you have, because multimodal by necessity entails space, right? And so it's really, I think, the question for the community of how best to use that right away, as you allude to here, this picture on the screen of Quincy, how can we best serve the various modes of travel we, uh, we'd like to have here in terms of the right way the city has. And, you know, down the line, there could be discussions about, you know, do we need an extra foot or something like that, but that could be an important uh, conversation. But I'd love to hear from the rest of the group too. So just to clarify, so in other words, we have right away, take, take your example, um, um, Mike, we have right away on either side of Quincy and on one side of it right now, there is a, there is a bike path, uh, pedestrian, pedestrian path. And on the other side of the road, it's still right away, but there's nothing over there. You're saying, hey, let's try to get some feedback with regard to should we make use of that additional right away and or should we change how it is used is that kind of what your what your what, what your thought yep, is definitely and what i what's interesting to me about quincy is is there the possibility of a dirt trail on the south side of the bike trail where uh horses could go and people could jog on it if they don't like hard pack services um but yeah basically looking at the existing right of way and does it need to be reorganized um, to allow more things to happen? Um, take out a, a lane of parking for cars and put in a bike lane, that kind of thing. Right. And <clears throat> for the well, consultant- keep in, I, keep in mind, however, that it, there are parts of Quincy there which are currently not utilized for say pedestrian, equestrian, et cetera, but are used for drainage. Uh, yeah. Think of the north side of Quincy, yeah, east right. of Colorado Boulevard. Um, you know, you can you can go over that, but keep in mind your drainage situation too. Right. Sure. It's a good point. I was going to say a lot of times I've worked on many corridor planning studies that relate to multimodal transportation, working with organizations like FHU, you know, the the, the group on our team. The topic of, you know, having, if you had perhaps two or three different ideas of how the right of way of Quincy could be used, often in a process like this, you'd get to that at perhaps the midpoint, the choices discussion. The question up front here might be really to 
ask the question, are you open to exploring the full range of a wider range of multimodal um, facilities and capabilities within the right of ways of streets in the city? So it's, that's kind of an opening question. That's how I, you would typically orient that question, but um, that's just kind of input from experience. And then ask for specific ideas after that. Right. And, and often, and it's a question of level of detail you go into in terms of a master plan updates. Um, if you had actually a corridor study for something like Quincy at the second meeting, you could actually have, you know, illustrated sections, you know, basically views down the street showing different choices of, hey, you can either have equestrian and bike or a question, you know, different kind of options for how to combine different modes on different streets. Not to be a buzzkill, but um, we don't necessarily have a budget in the, in the community-wide master plan to get into maybe that level of corridor planning, um, you know, but I absolutely think that there's the, the idea, the notion that, that uh, we would want to open up right away where it's technically possible uh, you know, we should ask, do people want to see more usage out of those corridors as a concept, as a policy is absolutely appropriate uh, for this kind of survey. Right. Thanks, Chris, for that clarification. It's, it's true. We're not going to be doing a detailed, um, you know, concept plan for every street. Um, there's some general images you can show to show examples of multimodal choices, though. <laughs> Just sort of a, and, and this will be a comment that I'll probably infuse throughout all of these things. It's, it's, and it gets to kind of the detail that we're asking in the questions, which we're going to talk about, you know, sometime in the future. But I want to get to a point where when we're asking these questions on these topics, we get a little more definitional. For instance, just take what you just said. Hey, should we make more use of our right of ways? See, that to me is a worthless question. Okay. As opposed to, should we make more use of our right of ways, for instance, to build a legitimate bike path that then right. will require or keep bikes off of the road and on the bike paths? That, that's the kind of thing that I want to start to see is get real feedback with regard to what people want, as opposed to these broader questions that everybody answers for the most part. Yeah, sure. It sounds good to me. I mean, <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. So that's like a legitimate one. Hey, should we make more use of the right of way? Okay, but what to what end? I mean, in other words, right. should we make more use of it to make a, a true bike path that then we'd expect bikers to utilize? And actually we'd start to, you know, you know, because there are there are municipalities, I mean, where there are legitimate bike paths. Our, ours is really kind of a not really, I mean, it's hard to have bikes and pedestrians and dogs and things on there at the same time. It's a, it's yeah. a dangerous So you can't really, you can't really ask the bikers to stay on there per se. They want to get on the roads because there's just too much other traffic on there. If you built them a legitimate bike, bike path, is that something that, the, that we'd want to see and that people would want to see and that bikers would respect? Uh, and if it was, then it's something that you look at. Anyway, it's just kind of a more of a specific with regard to the topic. Sure. No, I think I think that's a good point, and I think I think Britt was suggesting we start with an open-ended question, and then if you would like to see more multimodal use of the public right-of-way, what specifically do you like? Equestrian paths, bike paths, whatever. But get specific feedback in the next question, right? Sure. right. Okay. Anything yeah, else on multimodal? Sorry, Earl, what was that? No, no, that, I was just saying, yeah, we just want to be able to get to that second level pretty quick because. Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> Basically, want to avoid ultra softball questions that everyone will say, sure. <laughs> exactly. Real, real quick to, to that end, and, and I think, um, you know, Commissioner Holland was sort of starting to get at this. You know, we're throwing out a lot of potential topics, but uh, truthfully, you know, I, I don't know if I would recommend that we have a survey question for each one of these that we have on our list. Um, right. uh, so, so at, you know, we can provide more questions than we include on the survey. Absolutely. Don't, don't misunderstand that. However, if there's just a topic that you don't think that is providing a lot of value, um, you know, one of these bullet points, for example, 
and you're gonna you know to to earl's point you, know, you think uh th that's just not gonna get us that's not gonna move the ball down the field let us know that now so that we can spend our time on you know uh wording the the questions that that ha are likely to be included yeah well, great to, to that end um the, the second bullet point, traffic congestion on perimeter streets, Hamden, Bellevue, et cetera. Exactly what is Cherry Hills going to do about it? About congestion on Bellevue, for instance, since, you know, we are now part of a, part of a, a, a construction project to put in a light there at Glenmore. Somehow, I don't think that's going to reduce the congestion on Bellevue. In addition, I don't know if you've driven on 285 recently, but with that undergrounding project, which apparently is gonna last a year, things aren't getting any better there either. And this is beyond the capability of the village to have much input about, so far as I can tell, particularly with, uh, with, with state highways. CDOT controls them and, you know, you, you, you can ask the question, it may be a feel good point, but as far as implementing anything, uh, I, I think you're, uh, you're kidding yourself. I, I agree. And, you know, to put in a question of that nature and then not deliver on it, or of anyone who sits down and thinks about it and goes, why in, the, why in the world are they asking that question? They know bloody well it can't go anywhere with it. Yeah, I, I, agree, would, I agree with David on that, on that point. I mean... There's nothing that we can do with regard to with regard to those perimeter streets, other than to be mindful when we're engaged with, you know, uh, wider communities. We don't ever want, we, we never want to see traffic or congestion in our areas. But there's not much we can do, so I wouldn't be wasting a question on that. I think that's Dave's point, and I agree with it. You know, I know that we've uh, uh, um, Jim, our esteemed leader, who's on this call, by the way. Welcome, Jim. Uh, has been participating uh, in the uh, interchange project. Uh, at Bellevue and I-25, you know, to the extent that there's uh, specific uh, master plan goals and objectives about this type of idea, it, you, you know, one could make the argument maybe it gives uh, city reps more ammunition in their effort to, you know, leverage and barter for outcomes that are, are beneficial. But I would agree, they, it certainly isn't a decision-making capacity, but it certainly helps demonstrate the vision for the community that theoretically could be helpful in some way. So it, it, absolutely, if we think that we want to save our bullets for other questions, that would be a, that would certainly be a good one we could sort of not include. Any other bullet points from the multimodal transportation you know, in terms of topics that are similar? Anything to add to this yeah, list? The only thing that I'd add is, is that with regard to the cut through traffic one is, is that again, as you're thinking through it, the focus is to try to get our community to talk about not, not just, hey, do you like cut through traffic or do you not want it, et cetera, but with regard to alternatives. I mean, for instance, if we sat back and said, hey, traffic might increase on Colorado and Quincy because we're actually gonna try to have that flow more freely so that therefore it doesn't go down Mansfield and then, and then down Bel Air and then down, you know, uh, Dahlia and uh, those streets that keeps it out of versus no, we don't want any at all. In which case then you just try to just stop it completely. And then there's more uh, subtleties associated with that. But that's what I'd like to see with regard to that cut, those cut through traffic questions to really find out what our community thinks in terms of what the trade-offs are and what they're really willing to do. That's where I think we need to get some input there. Okay. I concur with Earl. Good. Good. Anything else on multimodal? If not, we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Parks and open space. On, on the final bullet point, improvements you would like to see to improve the quality, et cetera. I think one question which needs to be asked in this, in this survey, and I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, is are you, are you satisfied with the current level of service? Um, one of the things that occurs 
with the acquisition of additional parks and open space is, yeah, you you you've got the shiny object, but you don't have the you don't have the money for the polish to keep it shiny. Um, you don't know what to do with it, and and people are delighted to acquire more property, but if it just sits there, and no one's deriving any particular benefit, then what was the purpose of getting it in the first place? Well, um, I would have to argue with that a little bit because if you don't have the land, you can never do anything with it. And, and so admit, admit, I believe I, it's, it's better to get it and let it sit fallow and not maintain it than let it get developed and never get it at all because once it gets developed, it's gone. But yeah, I, I, I think that's true, but I think that all of that's true. But the issue is, is with regard to, let's face it, we have our parks and then for the most part, the open land that's available in Sherry Hills is privately owned. Okay, and so the question then is, is that do our, do our citizens want us to truly try, because that's what would keep the semi-rural, and, I, and I, I focus on the other word bucolic, which was in the last master plan, and it's like the only way that happens is that people don't build on this private land. Otherwise, if, when they do, so the question is, is does the city do something about that? Do you want us to do something about that? And then if you do want us to do something about that, how do you want us to pay for it? And that's one of the things that I want to see running through these areas as well, which is for all of these, are you satisfied with the level of service? Do you want more done? And by the way, if you do, you want us to raise taxes? You want us to cut other services? Or is it just something that you want? I think that's got to, I really want to see that go through a number of these things when we're talking about services or parks or additional things. I really think that's something that we, we've got to get some good feedback on. So I have a, I have a suggestion that, that may address both of those concerns. Um, in the last bullet point, why don't we say uh, improve the quality and service of the parks and open spaces and add the word service in there. Well, that, that's fair enough, but th there's something else I would add in on, and, and maybe you're aware of this. If you've been walking the high, if you've been around the high line for the last seven weeks, the volume, of the, the volume of traffic has probably increased by a multiple of four or five mm -hmm. on the high line. It's crazy. And, <clears throat> and I'm just wondering if this is a dress rehearsal for what the situation on the High Line is going to be once that underpass under 285 is completed. Um, do we need to be looking at the prospect of making some kind of enhancements to the High Line Trail? Don't ask me what, once that underpass is completed because of the increase in the volume of traffic. That's a good question. Would that be appropriate for this um, list of questions? Do you think? Well, I don't. I can't. I can't really say that it's that it's inappropriate. The point is that we know it's coming, and if we are making a master plan, you're trying to plan for the future. And if you, if there is an event which you know is imminent, and ignoring it in your planning process, then I think that's a uh, a foolish oversight. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. I think another topic that you might th think about, at least put on there for this area, is is a question or questions associated with Quincy Farms, because uh, I didn't see any of that in there. And of course, Quincy Farms is undergoing its own master plan now. But I can I know that it's undergoing its own master plan from the standpoint of. Um, the city, the city is going to support support that to whatever extent is necessary to implement that master plan. And I do think one of the things that we need to find out and get a little input from our from our community on is, is with regard to the restrictions and limitations that exist at Quincy Farms. Do you still want to see it developed with with um, you know taxpayer dollars, or would you only want that at the end of the day if if the restrictions were not quite as as, as they were, that, that, that there was more access and availability 
to this. I think that's something that this community doesn't really understand. Um, and I think that we need to get we need to get some input on that because future councils are really going to be faced with uh, some hard decisions with regard to Quincy Farms and the funding of it. Okay, uh, Earl, I think that's a great topic, but is that is that within a master plan update or is it maybe a little more specific with regard to an implementation? That's a, great, that's a great question, uh, Mike. It might be too specific for this, um, but I know that this is this is it's a big issue, and I know that this is really going to be the, our chance to get out there and and get get that input. I mean, Quincy Farms is a big undertaking if it goes the way that a lot think that it's going to go. So, what about a question? along the lines of would you support an additional tax to acquire and improve and maintain open space in Cherry Hills Village? You can ask the question, but there may be some people out there who remember that uh, With the divorce from South Suburban being complete, there's an additional, I don't know how much a year available uh, or the, the payoff to South Suburban being complete. And when the proposition was originally floated to leave South Suburban, the argument was made that the amount of money that people were paying to South Suburban would then be devoted to Cherry Hills own um, program of acquire for, for parks and open space that uh, we wouldn't simply be a cash cow for South Suburban anymore. Now, right. There, there may be some people, you know, that that uh, that dropout from South Suburban is what fifteen years ago, or, or maybe more. And and since since then, you know, some people have left and some people have moved in and don't know anything about it. But that was originally tended. Uh, intent or part of the, the deal was getting out of South Suburban was the money was going to South Suburban was going to go to Parks and Recreation. And that was part of the selling strategy of, of the referendum. Right. So, so translate that into a question for the master plan update. Mike, I, I think the question on number nine in the 2008 attempted to address this. And I think there's other, it's not all about buying property, taxing people. And there's, there's other ways to have open space. It doesn't have to be about an acquisition. And I think number nine gives some different ideas and you can maybe expound upon that. But I think it has to be somewhat open so you're not prejudicing the, you're not leading the answer, the witness, so to speak. You know, I think if you ask generally, is everyone for open space? They're going to say, yeah, sure. Okay. How about we, we tax you for it? I think that's a different thing. And I'd, I'd offer, I kind of like question nine. It was asked before and it might still be relevant in 2020. I think the bulk of it is there, there's one, one subheading in there that I think has been addressed somewhat already, but I won't go into that right now. Oh, we'll take it if you if there's a specific feedback you if if there's a some some momentum for this question but yet there's some uh, tweaks to it you'd like to see we'll we'll, we'll gladly okay. listen to it now in question, in question nine one of the choices was uh modified was number three increase uh -huh. building setbacks etc that was partially addressed by the residential standards development committee right bulk plane limitation, the floor area ratios, and so on. And uh, PNC had a subgroup now well, three, four, five, three, four years ago that was reviewing uh, some of the results from uh, the implementation of uh, residential standards, et cetera. And the, what, what the numbers showed up from the consultant was that the, uh, particularly with floor area ratios, the, the, the zoning category where it was pushed the most 
was in R3. Now, I would argue that R1 is the zoning classification, which lends itself best to the preservation of open space. It's kind of inherent. Now, admittedly, there are people who will, you know, max out what they can do on an R1 lot, but you got to have a lot of money to do that. And um, so that, that part of the question may have already been somewhat answered or could uh, phrase it in, or, or add something in there to remind people that, that there was a modification made within the last 10 years sure. uh, on, on that particular heading. And you know, do you feel it has had the desired effect? Good feedback. Let us, let us work on that uh, more specifically. Okay. And, I, and I think that's excellent feedback about how we can maybe start to zero in on that. But it does sound like there's a little bit of momentum for a uh, number nine in some form or fashion in the, in the 2020 survey. Before, I, I uh, think so. Ch Chairman, before we move on from this topic, um, we actually added bullets to this one. Um, I, I would ask a question of the commission. Uh, what would you guys think if we combined a few of these into a question that maybe hits on some of this, specifically the connectivity and access, uh, you know, therefore the quality of the trails of, of you know, for biking, pedestrian. Maybe there's a way we could kind of combine that into one question. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to, you know, ask a multi-part question that hits on everything, but I'm just trying to figure out ways to keep this from, you know, getting so large. Less is more, I agree. I guess, I guess a comment I'd make on that, Chris, is that, and I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but I thought about this when I looked at this, and I'm thinking more about it now, because I knew you'd want to be cutting down and adding to. And I don't know, I don't know that all of us are in the position of saying, hey, I want these bullets, I don't want these bullets. This is more of a, I think you're getting a lot of feedback and discussion that allows you then to take the liberty of saying, you know what, based on everything I heard, I'm going to combine these two, I'm sure. going to cut this one out. I mean, we'll tell you if we want something cut out, like okay. like, like like David recommended on the, the perimeter streets. But I think to a large degree, I'd feel comfortable with you taking our broad input here and then saying, hey, based on that, I know these guys, we can combine these two. Or that, Perfect. I think it'll be, I think it'll move quicker. That sounds right. great. Right. So I think, great. Yeah. I think that's a good point. So I uh, does anybody else have anything on parks and open space? I have one last comment. If if nobody else does. And that is, um, shouldn't there be a master plan for parks and trails for Cherry Hills Village? And I understand there is not, maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. Now that actually had been raised when, when, when the, the, the city was starting to work on a master plan for Quincy Farms, a question was raised, actually Rob Eber raised the question and said, you know, doesn't it seem like there should be a master plan for parks all along as since Quincy Park? And so I know that that topic has been discussed. So it's, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate point. And maybe it's a question for the survey. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think it should be wrapped up under the master plan itself. Pardon me? I think it should be included in one master plan and not have two separate master plans. I would agree with that as well. And I'm still wondering, we, have, we haven't articulated it this session yet, but how does all of this affect what the core of this whole plan was supposed to be defining semi-rural. How do we protect semi-rural? How do we make sure each one of these bullet points is focused on that? Or which came first, the semi-rural rural and the bullet points or? About, well, you know, I think that's a perfect segue into the community character <laughs> discussion. Right. But Kathy, do you yeah. have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that under the current structure of the code, uh, the code ordinances right now, PTRC is specifically charged 
with making recommendations to PNZ concerning the adoption of that portion of a master plan concerning park and trail development. Oh, good. I read that uh, along the lines of what Commissioner Miller said that really the parks and trails is an element of the entire master plan. That's um, great. And that you just pass that through PTRNC to get that additional uh, input. I, I, and Kathy, I think that's that's um, that's absolutely right. I, I will say that that code though can be read to suggest that um, there could be a standalone supplement to the overall master plan right. of, of a you know a standalone plan that covers those specific topics. Um, there's yeah, whole... in terms of how you structure it, but but really. <laughs> I think the, the concept is you have a big bucket, right? Yep. <laughs> Maybe you've got some sub buckets, but you've got correct. No, that's right. Yeah. And I think most communities do have an overall master plan, and then there might be a transportation plan, there might be a parks, trails, and open space plan. There right. could be various plans that feed into those, but they're all governed and guided by the master plan. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I I think it's a fair question uh, as far as what the, you know. It seems to me over the next 10 years or so, parks, trails, and open space are gonna be a huge topic. Uh, it's got some of the biggest costs. The funding is dedicated in some ways. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of difficult uh, questions, I think. And so, you know, it could be that a standalone supplement of a parks, trails, and open space plan may have real value uh for decision makers whether that's well, you guys I, I think or i think that's a good point and it would address what earl was concerned about which is how do we deal with quincy farms sure well, quincy farms is a big park and if you have an overall understanding of where you want parks how they're going to operate how they're going to be funded that helps with a specific property and the decision making on that property so I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. I agree. Yeah. I, have a, I have a question. Um, when I look at the original, not the original, the 2008 master plan, we, we, we lead the master plan, the details of the master plan with, with Cherry Hills Village's vision. I mean, shouldn't we be asking residents, hey, how do you envision the city? What do you see Cherry Hills 10 years down the road, before we get into these subcategories that we have to address. I think that's a question we should ask our, our residents. Where do you wanna see the city go? And then lead into the, to the specifics, which I think we should keep top level. But, so you know. I think that's a good point. And it, to me, that's really the community character question, yep. which is next. And maybe that should be the very first thing we start mm -hmm. with. Um, and if you guys are okay, let's go ahead and talk about that. Sure. Um, and I just had a couple comments. It seemed like the last, at the very end, we were talking about dark skies and undergrounding of utility lines. Isn't that part of the community character? I agree. Could we put those in that, in that, under that heading? Yeah, sure. I agree with that. I concur. Okay. And one thing I might add just from the way you roll out a survey, you don't have to roll out a survey by all these different subgroups. You could just have the 20 questions and have them kind of progress through a series of topics as opposed to having it totally broken down like this. This is really broken down by these slides just for our discussion tonight. We could okay, break it into like that, part A, B. Yeah. I like that okay. a lot. Okay. I don't think it should be grouped. Okay. So under the community character heading for discussion purposes, um, any comments there? Well, I guess one comment that I'd make, and I don't know what to say, I've never known what to say about it, but I know that when we go through this, when we go through the whole process, I know I'd like to see our master plan somehow get more specific with regard to what semi-rural and pastoral means, or, or we, have, we have other terms. Because I know through my past experience that those were, how many people do we have in uh, Cherry Hills, 6,500? 
that's got 6,500 definitions. <laughs> and, and, and so, and that's not, a, that's not a problem, but it is a problem when a very small subset of those comes before council to <clears> talk <throat> about things that they want done or how they want them done. Um, and I think that we should be looking to try to continue to provide uh, more and more structure, more and more definition uh, so for our future governance is able to, you know, better, better affect itself. Okay, so Earl, would you be willing to be the head of a subcommittee on defining some of <laughs> <Yeah>. rural character? <laughs> I second that motion. If I had, if I All in favor, answer, say aye. Aye, aye. aye, aye. 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 If I had the answer, I'd have given it already, believe me. <laughs> the answer is semi urban. <laughs> That's right. Um, but but to piggyback on Earl, if I can, you, you go to question 11, and we talk, I think there's ambiguity with character. And it, it talks about the character of the village. And I, I think I, I struggle with this because I think there's 6,500 people who have different view or opinion of as to what the character is. And I, I do think this has been a struggle for all of us. Yeah. as we approach this and if there's a way in the questionnaire to maybe avoid again leading with terms that are somewhat ambiguous and and help get some clarity i don't have the answer but i view that because i i read what does it protect the character well my view of character of the village may be very different than you know david or earls or whatever But I don't think you can avoid it. And of necessity, it's going to be a difficult conversation. But don't, don't, you, have, don't you have to start with what do you envision? What do you like about Cherry Hills? What do you want to preserve in Cherry Hills? Um, you know, what's, what's the essential character that you'd like to preserve and protect? What is, how do we define character for the village? Maybe well, that's. I, I think the community needs to define it. No, I agree, but I'm asking the question. I think, we ask, I, I think we ask the question. I don't think we we have the answers, but I I don't see how you can avoid asking the question. I guess is is my comment. Well, a good question may be just kind of speaking to these bullet points. You know, what are the most important? What do you think of when you think of? community character, what does that entail? Does it mean gateways, the streets? I mean, that could be instructive to get feedback on that, right? That might Middle provide a little bit of guidance on how to approach that character discussion as we go through, as opposed to the big picture, like, oh, it's semi-urban versus semi-rural. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, I totally agree with you, Brent. What are the, what are the, let's say, what are the five most important characteristics of Cherry Hills Village to you? I like that. That, that's more meaningful yeah. if you ask me. So, so let me throw out just an idea and I'll be honest with you. I don't think I love this idea, but uh, there's some challenges with it, but I wanna at least give you the opportunity to talk about it. Um, you know, we've, we've been kicking around, how do you get at this really vague question? Um, you know, and what we don't want is a Supreme Court answer of, you know, well, we know it when we see it. We, we want something more, we want something more specific. And so one of the ideas that we kicked around, and again, I think we're a little hesitant with it, but I just want to throw it out there. What if we had certain topics? Like, um, I think you guys mentioned this, at the last one, some people might consider overhead utilities to be semi-rural, right? And while other people may want to preserve views, so therefore undergrounding utilities is semi-rural. What, what if we had a few topics like that? Uh, open fencing versus closed fencing. Ro roads with, uh, you know, open swales versus, you know, uh, you know more uh, curb better sidewalk with uh, bike paths, you know, on, on the sides or something, right? I, I'm, I'm making stuff up. But my point is, what if we had these various topics and we had pictures to illustrate the contrast of the choices such that, you know, people are, are it's getting at that vision question that we were talking about a little earlier. What is the vision that you have for the community? And I wouldn't want to just say, 
do you like this picture or this picture? I, you know, my suggestion is if you do want to go down this road, you highlight a specific topic within, you know, sets of pictures, overhead utilities or roadways with, you know, um, you know, a more rural character to the, you know, as far as like a no curb gutter sidewalk or fencing types or, uh, you know, houses pushed back from the lot lines, et cetera. What, what would you think about that as a survey way? It, it would be good. I like, the one reason I like it is because frankly, pictures usually encourage responses on these kinds of surveys. Um, people like answering questions with pictures, but this is gonna be a hard one to execute. Do we pick Cherry Hill's question, uh, pictures? All of a sudden now we're asking people to vote on maybe somebody's house or lot that's included in the picture. Oh, that sounds awful. Um, you know, so there's some trickiness to it, but I wanted to throw it out there for you guys to kick around for a second. I'm inferring from your, um, what you say there, that the, the question of character or the definition of character is more likely to be defined through an assemblage of smaller components rather than trying to define it as a whole uh, yeah. at, at the outset. Yes, what, I, what exactly uh, uh, right. I, I mean, I think this discussion that we've had as, as a staff and consultant really comes from your discussion about saying that, that you know, we really hope to get more specificity so that people can't just use that, throw that phrase around, you know, to suit their individual preference at that moment in time. Well, the, how do you do that? That's hard. Well, the only way you're going to do that is to actually deconstruct what that means. Right. Right. And, exactly. and, and so we thought maybe pictures are one way to do it. I, I'm still, I'm, <laughs> I still got some concerns about how to execute that, but, but it is certainly one way to deconstruct the idea, the notion of, something really high level like semi-rural. Sure. Well, well so, I think in addition, I think in addition to that, and, I, and and this is kind of where I've always come from, it's like, hey, semi-rural, pastoral, either A, that's going to get more specific, or those terms are going to go away completely. Right. Okay. And then we're going to go towards, hey, we like view corridors. Okay. And, you know, and because I've always, I've always been one that said, you know, semi-rural, I've never been in a semi-rural area that doesn't have telephone poles. That's not I mean I'm for telephone, telephone, but I just, <laughs> it, it, to me, it was always like, this doesn't make any sense. But if you got rid of semi-rural and you said, we like view corridors, okay, that fits with bearing your, your, bearing your lines. I mean, we come more specific with regard to what we want to see in the right. We want open space. We want view corridors. We want <laughs> what, whatever the things might be and maybe we're adding to them maybe, and that's defining what the village look, but we don't have an overarching phrase or buzzword. Is it fair to say, Earl, that character is more determined by visual perceptions than anything else? Uh, oh. My first, I, I, I'd say, <clears throat> At first, I was going to say, yeah, I think absolutely. And then I was going to say, well, you know, there probably are some other things with character, but it's it's a big factor. Let's put it that way. It is a it is a, an overriding factor, I think. OK, so then I would suggest Britt then that. Whatever we come up with in terms of questions. Takes that into account. Um, rather than, you know, asking people to 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 write it out. This, this notion uh, that I believe Chris raised about using pictures, you know, I like this, I don't like that. Now, which pictures is gonna be, yeah, that's that's gonna be a lot of fun, but, um, but visual perception here, I think is gonna be a big component in getting the, the term character defined for us. Right, and I think we, we always thought that would be the case along the way here. Okay. Character is a noun, and I'm wondering if you add a transitive verb, it might help move it and define it. And a transitive verb is, it's related to the relationship of what you're talking about, and in this case, character. And I'm just thinking from an English standpoint, maybe 
we get hung up on a word because we're not taking it far enough. It's too open there. Right. But maybe if we add to that and help be a little more specific, it, it could be helpful. Okay, so I think we're all in agreement. We want to break down the broad definition into smaller component parts that are easier to agree upon or disagree upon. And that right. may be relatable. Yeah, I agree. Elements of character, elements of a vision, important quality of life issues. I don't know what, but maybe we could turn this back over to, to Brett and, and the staff to work on. Okay. Mr. Sure. Mr. Kramer. I think that works. We okay. may take a crack at a couple of visual preference kinds of questions to tease out the these deconstructed elements and and um, you know uh, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words on this and uh, maybe there's a way to to really define this better and let people you know sort of an easy selection yes no no yes etc so let us take a, a crack at it perfect right. okay moving on to the next one sustainability i would i would add to that sustainability and resiliency and um maybe brit could define those terms right <clears throat> well they're fairly related resiliency is a broader topic that goes beyond most what most people think about in terms of environmentalism but really to overall preparedness and resiliency of the community from economic, social, community, environmental, different aspects, right? Yeah. And that term has been thrown around in Colorado quite a bit since the 2013 floods. I think there's been a lot more discussion about it. Really, the term should be more broadly encompassing of planning. So it could be an overarching kind of theme for the master plan update, the topic of resiliency. I think it's a question for you all and for the community as to that term and if you want to get into that more, more of that discussion here in the process. I mean, to me, resiliency is what you want to have to deal with the effects of climate change. More heat, more flooding, more temperature extremes, uh, lack of moisture, drought, things like that. Sustainability is renewable energy and uh, other things that you do to to protect the climate resiliency is how you deal with a changing climate and its impacts is is what it means to me right well, can, can i ask though with regard to with, and both of these are important topics obviously for obviously for for states for broad communities um etc with regard to cherry hills village what what aspect are we asking this? Are we asking it with regard to things that we want the city to do, you know, with regard to their own operations, which I don't know how much would factor into that. Or are we saying, hey, we're going to start to try to drive our, our, our building um, uh, requirements so that, I mean, how does it manifest itself? With well, regard what, to Cherry Hills Village. Right. I mean, at this point in the process, you know, someone mentioned the vision topic, which is a very good point here at the outset of the master plan update. I think one question for the community could be really should sustainability resiliency be a key theme or focus for the overall effort for the community going forward? Because that can start to set an umbrella or at least capture many different aspects of the master plan update. You know, for example, the vision, who knows, coming out of the vision could be character, whatever you want to define with that, coupled with the idea of a resilient community, right? So I think it could be perhaps uh, taking the temperature on that. What do you think, Earl? Right, because I think, I think that that's an important concept, with, in the way that you were just describing it, which is, this is obviously an important topic for, you know, for the world, for the country, for the state. I mean, it's important to us all. I think everybody feels that it's something that we want to support and do what we can to do. But with regard to a master plan, it's like saying, you're basically saying to the city, 
this is what we're going to do. And I think your slides apropos, I mean, if all of a sudden this became a priority in the master plan, that by definition says, okay, what are we going to do about powering our city hall so that it's by renewable energy? I mean, we're going to make that happen. And I question whether we will. So I, I mean, in other words, I question what Cherry Hills Village will do, you know, in terms other than just having it in there because it looks good. I mean, but it, if it's going to be in there, then there's got to be some, there's got to be some meat behind the bones that this is what the city is going to do. And if we, if there is some stuff that, you know, how is it going to manifest itself, then that's great. But I don't want something in there that looks like, hey, uh, you know, we're a green community, but not really. Well, the master plan is intended to provide a framework to encourage certain things to happen. It's not a mandate that the government, that the village has to put solar panels on its roof. No, but I, I do think though, I do think though, Mike, that the master plan, it's, it's, it's not a mandate, but it is a blueprint. It's kind of like, it's, it's somewhere between, somewhere between a blueprint and a constitution. This is what I expect. This is what I did when I was on council. And this is what I expect our council representatives to do. I expect you guys to implement this. Whatever's in here, I expect that's what you're going to do. And I expect staff to do that. That's what this master plan is. That's why it's so important to get the feedback. This is what we're, we're going to move in this direction, people, because this is what we as a community said we're going to do. And by God, I expect our elected leaders to do and, and to make that happen. You see what I'm saying? Sort of. I mean, yeah. people want more, more parks and trails. That doesn't mean go out and spend $5 million and buy a new a piece of parkland. It just means we want more parks and trails. If we want to encourage sustainability, we can provide that directive and you can do it through a system of incentives that doesn't <clears throat> mandate that anybody has to spend the money. It's more of an encouraging set of principles. Well, where a master plan or comprehensive plan lands in terms of the specificity depends on the community, especially in a community or a state like Colorado, where these documents are advisory. You know, there's other states like California where they have a lot more teeth and involve a lot more detail in many cases. But, you know, most comprehensive plans or master plans, and Chris jump in, they can provide a bit more specificity in terms of like here's specific goals and metrics and action items on these different areas. So, you know, it's kind of, it's finding that sweet spot, right? You want enough specific action items so that 10 years from now, a community can say per Earl's point, yes, we accomplished 26 of the 30 action items out of the master plan, right? But also, you know, to the other points made, it's not gonna get into the deep details of, oh, we should have 25 solar panels, right? I mean, it it's kind of an in-between, if that helps. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just, so I, I've worked on a sustainability plan before, which is another one of the subsets to the overall master plan. Um, I mean, I do think Earl is on to something in that, uh, you know, when you look, if you were to just do a survey of 10 sustainability plans or the sustainability element in a lot of other jurisdictions, com comprehensive plans, a lot of it isn't necessarily going to be applicable in Cherry Hills Village. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about energy consumption, especially as it relates to commercial and especially industrial uses. Um, there's often a lot of discussion about waste, um, recycling. Um, obviously, that is not something that the city necessarily controls. Um, energy, as far as uh, energy providers, uh, you know, solar versus other utilities that might come into play and obviously jails, other than the ability to require solar as a part of new construction, doesn't have a lot of opportunities for that. Um, you know, I, I think realistically, the most specific outcome of this kind of discussion would probably be more aggressive sticks, not carrots, but sticks, because we already have some carrots related to bu green building. So when folks do construction or remodeling projects, uh, what kind of building codes could they utilize to, to enhance more sustainability? Um, the city already has a program in place to incentivize that. So realistically, the next step would be, you know, requiring it. And, you know, for a lot of communities, that is a step they don't want to 
take. So I think Earl's question is, is a good one <laughs> for you guys to consider. Uh, it, Cherry Hills doesn't have the, the regulatory framework or control that a lot of other communities have. And maybe this just isn't as big of a priority. Maybe it is. I'm just throwing it out there that I think for a lot of communities, it's a de facto chapter, end of story, not even a debate. But, but they also have control over so many more aspects of this topic that, that Cherry Hills doesn't. Well, I don't, I don't agree with you guys. I, I think that it's an important thing for the community. And I think you're gonna find the community thinks it's important. And I think there are a lot of ways you can incentivize people. Um, we should encourage people to recycle. Why would we not encourage people to recycle? I'm not saying we need to buy special dump trucks for Cherry Hills Village. I'm saying we should encourage it. We should encourage composting. We should encourage energy savings. We should encourage insulation in building materials. Um, you know, if people want to put solar on their rooftops, we should encourage that. I don't, I don't see where it imposes a huge obligation on the government to promote these ideas in a master plan. We're not even talking about the master plan. We're talking about survey questions to the community. And yeah, we, need to ask the, we need to ask the community what's yeah. important to them. And this has to be broadcast to the community at every stage of the discussion. And I have to sound off now um, this was a good discussion. You raised, you've all raised a number of really important points and we can move on from this moment now. Thank you for having, letting me particip participate. <laughs> Wait, you can't leave now. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're not finished yet. Oh my God, Mike. Okay. So let's get some questions though for the, for the survey. Sure. We, sustainability. We, we can do that. Right. We'll work on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Planning for aging populations. Seems like an interesting topic for the community. Any feedback on these general topic areas? And again, this is not the specific questions that we'll be working on it for the next handful of weeks, but uh, how important do these topics seem? Hi, this is Jen Brett. Um, I think I think providing uh, senior housing is extremely important, given the current climate that we're in right now. So, like when I saw this, I was like, "Well, I'm just throwing out a suggestion." Okay, what about if we take these homes that a senior citizen lives in, and and they could rent it out to other senior citizens, and and just kind of like charge. <clears throat> property tax or find a way to to allow seniors to stay in the village and not downsize but stay together somehow and and get some revenue off of it too have you been seeing that movement in other cities is it kind of a co-housing model is that what you're uh... Uh, yeah it's like your roommate yeah, but it's, you know, it's not just housing, but it's like a little bit more where additional care is given to our seniors. All right, and I, and I think that that's where this question is going to really from the standpoint of saying, because other than services, we're talking about making zoning changes. And that that's really what we need to be asking our community is yeah. whether we can, hey, how do you feel about, you know, it, 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 you know, taking a single family home and making it, making it multifamily, where I don't know how you exactly define that, Jennifer, but it means something like that. Or how do you feel about having, you know, multi, multi-unit uh, developments on some of our properties? That, that's where we're getting to with this. And I, and I do think this is something we need to ask our community if they want to, if they want to want to pursue that. <laughs> I don't think, I think a multi-unit and, development. And if you ask them that question, how will that be concur, how will that be congruent with the character of the community, particularly <laughs> if you get into the issue of semi-rural. I agree. Well, I, I have a comment on that though, because I think you can do both. When somebody lives on two and a half acres, why should we not 
ask the question, should we allow auxiliary dwelling units? A carriage house in the back, uh, converting a garage to an apartment, creating a mother-in-law accommodation of some sort, which is not allowed under the current zoning. And with two and a half acres or one and a half acres or even an acre, there's plenty of room to do that and accommodate. For seniors. For, uh, and, maybe, and maybe it's limited to seniors or what, <laughs> I don't know, but but I think that's I don't a want question. Like a frat house like brewing on a two and a half acre property. It's just for our wonderful seniors in our community. <laughs> no frat houses. Okay. Just, just I do want to highlight. Uh, it's a great way to raise funding and, and revenue. Uh, under the community character slide, the third bullet did top. So this is a crossover topic. Uh, but that specifically under the character discussion, we did highlight, uh, you know, should different housing types, such as senior housing, be part of the community character. So we were trying to hit on this specific topic which really sets the table for zoning, um, which is right. you know, what Earl and, was and talking about. It really about. does. And I think, I think that's an important factor. And I know Bill's mentioned this several times. <clears throat> in, our, in our questions out there, we're not, we're not pursuing an agenda. We're, right. we're trying to gather information. And in this case, what we're trying to gather is, you know, obviously, should the, should the city do more to, to try to help with our, with our aging population? That question in and of itself, everybody's going to say yes. But you're going to get down into it and go, okay, now we're talking about zoning changes and or we're talking about providing services. And are we for that as a community? That is a question that needs because it pops up from time to time. I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm not, I'm not going to bet on it. We need to ask it and we need to find out what our community <clears throat> thinks about, about doing those things. Because that is what it's going to do is it, it is going to be zoning changes. Mm -hmm. sure. It's really, it's really a land use question. Yep. Yeah. At it the is. end of the day. Yes. It, it is all of that, but couched within that question or what you're tossing at the community, trying to get their input on. Should there be a caveat in there that says, you blow up R1 in Cherry Hills and we're just another suburb. It won't be, it will only be a matter of time before we start to look like Aurora or Lakewood or something else. Hanging on for 45 years, I don't believe there has been a success, pardon me, since 1945, I don't believe there has been a successful rezoning from R1 to a higher density. I may correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that particular dike has held. And I think that, that the R1 is a major component of of what makes Cherry Hills what it is. Blow that up, even if it's along the edges, and I think ultimately you're going to wind up kissing the whole affair goodbye. Well, I think that's an interesting opinion, but um, I don't think we should prejudge the answer to the questions we're asking. You don't have to prejudge it, but you have to, but I think it is fair to ask that if you want to start, as Earl points out, if you did, did that pushes you in the direction of zoning changes to ask people to consider, do you want to see a major zoning change in Cherry Hills? Because it is a big deal. Right? Yeah, no, I agree. And, I think and, that's- and the point is, is, David, I, I don't actually, my opinion doesn't matter, but my opinion probably is like yours. And I think the community is gonna go that direction, but I don't know the answer to that question. I'd like to know, but I think the community is going to basically say what you just said. I do. Then let's get rid of the question. No, well, but no, I but I think we have to because it's popped up enough, and it pops sure. up. And it pops up the way a lot of questions do in this community, without specificity, without people doing their homework. It's just a lot of arm waving. And part of what I wanted help to do with this master plan is to get rid of some of the arm waving. Guys, we're talking community. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this once and for all. Do we want to do these things or not? And if we don't, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. And if we do, this is what the impact's gonna be on the community. These are important questions. We're not just gonna talk about it, you know, at a cocktail party and a lot of arm waving, which is the way this question comes up a lot of times, but nobody thinks about the ramifications. 
Well, so so it's appropriate to do to have it as part of the survey. I agree. And, I think if to, for purposes of the survey, you just have to put it out there as a should we have these, <clears throat> anticipating that it would you know moving that forward would require major changes to land use codes. Right. And, and keeping in mind, this document is an advisory document for city council. So when the question comes up later, they can say, we've considered this and it doesn't work, or we've considered this and it might work, but it lays a foundation for council to, to deal with these issues in the future. Absolutely. So I think we need to ask the question. That's a good point. I think what I hear you guys saying is that you wanna have a pool predicting what the outcome of these questions are going to be. <laughs> okay, so well, I think, I think it, is fair, it is fair to ask the question, but, as, yeah. uh, but I think Earl's point is to, to get past the arm waving stage, put in some, put, make it sufficiently specific <laughs> that, that it, when you formulate your answer, you realize there is a, there is a potential cost. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So why don't we put that back to Britt and Chris and they can solve that problem. Yep. I think we got some ideas. Yep. Okay. Okay. Moving on to community facilities. This seemed to me to have a lot of, um, I don't know, maybe some of these topics are dealt with elsewhere. Stormwater is an infrastructure issue. Highline Canal. Any comments on this list of I'm, questions? I'm, I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I'm confused. I, I would have to say, I don't get some of this stuff. What, what is the big issue with stormwater management? You have detention requirements, I believe, on some properties. Um, as long as you haven't, as long as you haven't uh, paved over the property in its entirety, it, it should minimize your runoff coefficients. So where's where's the issue, or is this simply emanate from what happened five years ago? Well, I would I will say one thing on the Highline Canal. Um, there is an opportunity to put surface runoff into the canal after it's discontinued as, as a water irrigation supply ditch, which is what it still is today. And to the extent you can put stormwater in the canal, uh, you can reduce the need for the on-site retention, which in some cases totally bastardized, bastardizes people's yards. Um, so, so it gives an opportunity to deal with stormwater in a maybe a more beneficial way. I submit that the canal is already used for stormwater runoff. So you got to do is look at the, the bridge that goes over to Dahlia Hollow Park, the foot of Bel Air Street, Peyton Manning's yeah. property. No, there are it, a bunch it, of places. It, it, it absolutely there are a is, bunch of it, places which are right. dumping stormwater into the canal and right. have been for the last 50 years. Right. It's not supposed to be used that way. But, but, but I think the, the, the idea here is that there's an opportunity to fund at key spots along the canal and other places, in addition to the High Line, where you could maybe have facilities, and I don't want to, you know, that, that are bigger, that are larger, that would probably require some, some level of investment from the city that would have the opportunity to provide uh, benefits to many properties around it. Right, um, right. And so, so under a model like that, it would probably require some funding stream. Um, and that's really where the, these drainage questions are going. Um, do we want, and it's similar to the underground of uh, the utilities, right? Do, would you be willing to pay, uh, you know, a tax? Is there an impact fee that, you know, gets charged to development? Um, you know, there, there well, are other things that could be done. Is there an appetite for that? I think it's, it's a little more simple in that case, because oftentimes, and I can show you half a dozen homes that look like miniature golf courses where if you said to that homeowner instead of all these on-site retention ponds you can put it in the highline canal and you can have a level or a flat yard 
that otherwise would cost 10 or 20 or 30 grand to contour to create the detention pond. So, so there may be a simple answer with a property owner who's developing and not a tax on the rest of the community. That's just an alternative for, for storm drainage. Well, if we, get, thing, well, if we continue to have drought, storm drainage won't be much of an issue. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, putting storm drainage aside, I do think that the first bullet is an important one or questions associated with regard to, with regard to our police department and public safety to get some input and to get some feedback with regard to what our community thinks. Um, uh, because, because of issues that have popped up in the last couple of years, it's been, it's been a big issue. I think we're going to find out, I don't know what we're going to find out, but, um, well, my opinion doesn't matter. I mean, I, I personally think that we've got an incredibly safe community and we've got a great police department, but not everybody shares that view. And the issue is, is I do think we need to find out what our community does think specifically what their issues are and what they'd like to see. Um, uh, to provide some input in that regard for, you know, for the police department if, um, as well as council. So I do think that first bullet is important. However, those questions are going to be devised. Let us take a shot at a question on public safety and then also maybe a singular question on, you know, drainage as it relates to potential costs, either to developers or, you know, residents. Let it, let us, Take a crack at a question on that too. Okay, that sounds good. What about the last bullet point? Additional community facilities to be considered. Um, we didn't have anything specific. Just if you had something that you wanted to, that we haven't thought of, let us know. I think it's a good question uh, for the community. I do too, but almost just in the way that it is, is, hey, is there anything else you'd like to see? Again, I don't know that. In, I don't think there's going to be anything overwhelming, but it would be good. I think that's a legitimate question. Hey, we've just done a big capital program. We've basically done everything we need to do from the last master plan of a cap from a capital project perspective. Now, looking forward to the next 10 years, anything else this community would like to see? And I have no, no ideas and I, I don't know what will come up, but I think it's a, it's a good question. Sure. We've, we've talked about sidewalks a little bit. You know, if we're going to have senior communities and people walking a little more, uh, the lack of sidewalks, especially with cut through traffic where people are trying to get to their destination faster, I think we really need to consider uh, and prioritize that in terms of really looking at community needs. I mean, community facilities. So, would that would that go back into the um, discussion on the right of way, the multimodal, and I think so. I was thinking of it there, actually, Mike. Um, okay. But then let's make sure we get that covered in in the uh, multimodal discussion. That's a good point. Okay. Hey, Mike, good. Do we discuss, um, do we discuss cops? Or uh, public safety question would could cover that. Yeah, I think we really need to bring an emphasis to that in the survey. Um, I've been hearing a lot of chatter and people are really concerned with the increased crime in our community. And we're always a target. You've heard Mayor, previous Mayor Chrisman always <clears throat> say articles are written about Cherry Hills and et cetera. So I just think an, a heavy emphasis should be added to that. Okay, under the public safety topic? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, how about economics? Do we have any more to add there or any uh, modification to that question, <laughs> I guess it is? Is it too vague? For the city. Well, I guess just a question in terms of, you know, Britt or Chris, what, what you're thinking about in, in terms of that. I mean, obviously our forms of revenue are, are um, you, know, tax, you know, real estate and sales taxes. 
Obviously, there is, you know, then the city can take on debt, but be subject to um, uh, a vote. Uh, we've done COPs. I mean, are you thinking about asking for things such as that? Or are you thinking more about in terms of saying, because there's been discussion over the last several years of, of a city foundation, if you will, a, a private, uh, you know, 501c3 type organization that is created to take in donations to provide, um, uh, you know, contributions to the city. Um, you know, uh, the land preserves talked about that. Other individuals, private citizens have talked about creating a foundation such as that. There've been discussions as well about creating foundations to support the police department. Um, so are you thinking that kind of thing? That could be a possibility. Um, in terms of funding strategies, we thought about there could be a question you're asking about. It kind of relates to land use, which is, you know, in the case of Cherry Hills Village, I think we've assumed since day one, you're not talking about, hey, should we have a lot more retail, obviously, to change the funding strategy that way. Um, it could be a question about things like foundations, could be uh, questions about should be should, should we look at the mix in a different way in terms of taxes versus fees, impact fees, things like that. How does development pay for itself? Things like that, right? There, there's also the discussion, and, and Earl, I think you're you're familiar with this. There, there's no use tax in Cherry Hills, like a lot of other communities, right? Um, you know, do we want to? What happened to the dollar? What happened to the dollar and a quarter? Uh, per square foot fee on uh, on building, if that's not a use tax, it's that's a service expansion fee. I think I think if I'm understanding correctly, that's that's not a use tax though. That's only applicable in limited circumstances. Um, and I know there's been some before I was here. I know there were questions about you know the um, how should I phrase this the um, the sustainability of that kind of fee. Uh, from, you know, being challenged uh, from a legal perspective. Well, it's, well, it's been it's been on the books since at least 1985, and and it still seems to be alive and well, because it shows up whenever you get a building permit. <clears throat> Not all building permits, uh, just just for certain types. So, can we on this topic uh, get? more specific or at least have a general question followed by specific um, strategies or methodologies that people can look at? Well, see, and that's where I was coming from, which is to go, hey, if we think that there's something out there that we're not thinking of and we'd like to get some public input on it, right. keep looking at these in terms of what can we get rid of versus what what can what should we have in here as a question? And I'm just not certain what it is. This question, how it's how how that would be written, and what uh, what benefit the city would get out of the feedback from the city, sure, from the community, from the residents. Right. If there is, great, let's put it in. But I'm like, what is that question, and what are we going to get? We'll give us some thought, and, and it may be that there's not really an economics focused question in the survey. It's not a mandate. You have to have one here. Okay. That sounds good. We'll look to your guidance on that. Okay. Um, other topics, I had suggested those two go in the character sure. heading. Uh, is everybody okay with that? And if yes, do you have other topics? The only one, the only other one that we, I haven't discussed so far or hasn't been discussed, and again, this might be too specific, but um, the question of art in the village, and uh, and that, that probably is a character question, and I don't know, maybe that's that's too specific, but it is it is a it's always a controversial topic. I assume you mean including potential funding as well for that. Yeah, right. I mean, just the whole. Yeah. So public art specifically. Public art, yeah, public art. Sorry. Yep. That's, yeah. Right. So I that is a pretty classic question, to be honest with you, for a master plan. I absolutely think that could be uh, to, to inquire about. You know, we talk about the vision. What's the vision for the community? Uh, that is right there. Right there with it. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 
And now where we have a member of our community, not now, she's, she and her husband have lived in Cherry Hills Village since they moved back to Colorado. Susan Cooper, whose work is on display at the uh, Village Center, she would be a great resource to help keep that alive and to expand it and maybe even to help with her experience with funding it. Good idea. Okay. We like the funding part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Earl likes the funding part. There you go. Okay. Um, anybody have anything else? Uh, any topics that we missed or need to add or modify or whatever? Seems like a pretty comprehensive list. Yes. Um, if not, I guess, um, Chris, we should move on to Citizens Advisory Task Force. And the question is, do we want to do a draft of these survey questions and give, give it to them for input? Or how do you guys see that playing out? Before, before we jump into that specifically, let me just talk for a moment about what I know about um, you know, the opportunities to meet in okay. person. Um, you know, I know that um, the next two city council meetings are going to likely be held virtually. Um, you know, I do think there's an opportunity for, well, maybe the June 2nd one, but the second meeting in June might be held in person. Um, but again, I think there are some different pressures there. You know, the, the charter, I think, requires at least one meeting a month. Um, not that it has to be in person every time, but, you know, there's certain contracts that need to be executed. The, the business of the city has to keep moving. Um, you know, the, the master plan is different. There's no external pressure. We have no funding uh, uh, risks that are going to expire. Um, and so, you know, part of this is going to be, I, in, in many ways, my guess is you all know as much as we do about when, A, from a regulatory perspective, when the state and, and Tri-County might open things up more than they are today. We don't, we don't necessarily have great knowledge of when that's going to be. Sure. Uh, but the second thing is, just because <clears throat> it it's, might be legally possible, uh, you know, we also want to make sure people are comfortable in participating. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's more of the art of this is, you know, when do we do this? And, um, you know, I think as we were thinking about the role of the Citizens Advisory Task Force, you know, the, the survey might be a good kicking off point for them to provide feedback. Again, they aren't going to vote. They aren't going to provide, uh, you know, specific, uh, you know, uh, questions or, or wording to you or anything, but they do have an opportunity to provide, uh, you know, a good sounding board. And I, and I think of, you know, our PTRC re delegate, as we talk about some of those parks, trails and open space questions that might sure. be helpful feedback for you all. So um, I, I don't have a lot of great guidance for you. I, I, I just know that it's, it's somewhat vague. And if you, we really wanted to be aggressive, I think there would be opportunities in probably late June or July to have a CAT in person. Um, but that, you know, this, that leads to the second question of, do you want to, even if we could? So I'll be well, So Chris, are you suggesting an, an interim step maybe to send them the, a draft of the questions and, and let them respond before a meeting? Yeah, and if I could just chime in there before Chris answers, I wouldn't recommend that. I, I think that we need to keep this process moving. We've had, we, we've given the input, you guys are gonna start drafting the questions. I would go out to the cat, <clears throat> go out to the cat and ask them and say, hey, by the way, I'd like to get your feedback with regard to topics. You're not reviewing anything, you're providing input coming in. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then you'd see that in, that you'd see that information and synthesize it with regard to what we've just talked about here. And probably a lot of it's gonna be repetitious, I would think. Uh, some of it, you can sit back and go, hey, based on what I've heard from P and Z, I'm not gonna worry about that. Wow, 
that's a really interesting one that nobody had thought of and that PNZ and that maybe then you might let us know type of a thing. But otherwise, you just take that input and massage it in with what we've just given you as you're putting together your questions. And when we're ready to go out, we, we go out with them. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Would it make sense for them to go through the same exercise we just went through? Or do you think that has too much information? Well, um, that what you're saying then is, is kind of a virtual cat meeting. And uh, I, uh, I think that that would be, I don't know. I, I, think, that would be, I think that would be difficult. Um, I think I'd just ask them and say, hey, we're, we're moving along. You know, we, you know, you've already communicated with them, Chris, you know, COVID, blah, blah, blah. Sorry about all this, yada, yada. But we are wanting to keep this moving to the extent we can, which is nowhere near like we thought we'd be doing, but we are doing what we can. And to that extent, like to get your guys' topics, one, two, 15, whatever, send them in by email into you. And uh, that, that's what I do at this point. What's your thought on that, Brett? Well, you guys you know, comprise a decent chunk of the CAT, and the CAT is fairly large. So it's a lot of cats in the kitchen, right? Yeah. So they should have a meaningful role, but even in a normal circumstance with that larger group, it could get complicated to go through and parse questions X, Y, and Z. Many communities do that. It kind of depends on the flavor of the community. Um, <clears throat> I think you'd probably want to meet with the CAT if, if the survey is developed here in the next month or next three weeks, whatever, and we share the questions with you and start to get it buttoned up and so forth and ready for sending it out here in the summertime. Even if the CAT just provides input on topics, just for them to feel like they're part of something that not the train hasn't totally left the station. I would suggest that we want to try to meet with them in person sooner rather than later, whenever it's possible. I mean, maybe it's July, right? So <coughs> at least you meet with them and say, hey, you know, thank, we appreciate your input on the topics. We work with the PNZ and here's a survey that's gone out. We're gonna get survey questions back here in the summertime, early fall, and we'll have a little bit more momentum to keep the ball rolling here. Um, I guess my, to cut to the chase, you can tell from my comments that you could avoid a, a, a really uh, circular discussion with the CAT and just keep the ball mo moving, as Earl suggested. But it's really for you all to decide, you know? Well, I guess my question is, how do we get their input right now without having them go through this process? Just Yeah, that's the tricky part, because off, usually you would have some sort of kickoff meeting with a CAT. Right, you wouldn't just toss these questions out to the group, so that's a little bit clunky. I'll I'll say that. Well, I, let, let me just throw something out, and this is this is for the commission to decide. But I do think there's a way, in some ways, a very open-ended approach may work because we haven't had an orientation, so to speak. Yeah, and and it would be <laughs> it's almost an exercise to get them thinking. You know, what are the what are the important issues to them? What have they been hearing? And it's, it's almost more open-ended. There's zero leading. Sure. Right? You, you don't say, here's, here's the, uh, you know, the nine topics that PNZ came up with. What do you think? No, it's yeah, more like, right. what are your top topics? And you leave Good. it at that. And therefore, right. the, the orientation isn't necessarily needed. Right. Well, or it, it still would be ideal, but maybe we could get it by without it and for just this one exercise. Right. And then, <laughs> and then we could get their input without necessarily having to make the the tough choice about virtual versus in person right. and that whole dilemma right sure. and 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 i can't remember what communication there has been just with regard to the cat but you know i do think it's appropriate that something would be sent out and sit back and say hey you know uh you know covid19 you know we haven't done what we're gonna do we're hoping yeah. we'll be back later on you guys are important in the interim before because nobody knows Yep. Hey, if you've got anything you want to add in with regard to topics and want to contribute those, shoot me an email and just fire it in. And hopefully they're just bullet points because that's what we're looking for here as right. we're stimulating and trying to develop this. And hopefully we'll be able to have a meeting sometime, you know, in the next uh, the next few months. But we may not. The and other thing I'd say go forward. in terms of uh, communication with the CAT is that 
you know, I think it makes sense to, to solicit just general topics and just really emphasize that this is really an opening process, opening element of the process. And, you know, we got into some, you know, quite a bit of specifics here in our discussion tonight, but, you know, I mentioned there could be a second survey and a third survey, and this is just the beginning of the process. They're going to have their hands on a lot of the details and elements of what goes into the master plan throughout the next year or 15 months, right? So, yeah, absolutely. right. So I think it's just, you know, solicit and put on topics, get that survey together. I do think for my earlier point, you know, we are in weird circumstances here, but just so they don't feel like they're just this ephemeral email contribution group providing topics, you'd want to try to do some sort of get together with them, hopefully in person, if we're allowed to this summer. Sure. Oh yeah, you would. And by the way, one of the things, and I don't even know that this has been, I think this would be part of your email when it goes out to them. I don't, I don't know that it's been communicated to anybody that in fact, there's going to be a survey, but that's one of the things you'd say, sure. which is PNC's sure. already made this determination. Right. We're proceeding with it, letting you know, yeah. how about some contribution? We want you guys to feel part of this. Give us some, give us some input. I mean, sure. of, of topics. Sure. And uh, Kathy, for your benefit, I, I would certainly include a little note at the end of all this saying, if you do have thoughts, <laughs> Make sure you respond directly and not reply all. Right. <laughs> could I um, could I inject another question into the discussion? I noticed in the survey, so many of the answers were satisfied, not sure, dissatisfied, or yes, no, don't know. Um, when I look at a survey that says satisfied, not sure, dissatisfied, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you can be somewhat satisfied. Is there any way we could take a look at those? Well, my general comment is, I have this survey from 08 in front of me here. Like I said, like I said it was very thorough. It was done by a company that does more of these kind of macro surveys community-wide as part uh -huh. of it. And that's fine. I would say this survey and really all the surveys involved with this master plan update will be you know, the, the options are going to be a little more tailored to Charlie Hills Village, right? Yes, yeah. As opposed to yes, no, scale of one to five, you know, it's going to be, again, we're not doing like, for example, a quarter study for Quincy, but it's going to be, hey, what kind of ideas do you, would you like to see on yeah. certain streets, you know, yeah. blank, blank, right? Yeah. Get more ideas as opposed <clears throat> to. Yeah. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking. This is a well-educated community and they have their, their thoughts are backed up with a lot of experience and you know good plans. So I'd like want to be able to capture as much of that as possible when they respond to the survey. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, thanks for that, Doris. That was a good good point. Um, Chris, what else do we need to do here? I'd like to get this wrapped up. We're going on two hours. Sure. Uh, so I guess the real question is, um, the next meeting and when uh, you folks would like to get back together to discuss specific wordings of specific questions. I will tell you, I am not going to be available. The, I'm out the week of our June scheduled meeting. I'm out that whole week. So um, that doesn't mean though that we can't meet in June. It would really be you know, a conversation facilitated by Brett and Ethan will obviously still be able to help uh, with, with the meeting as well. So uh, that shouldn't prevent us from meeting. I just won't be a part of that conversation. Okay, that so time. we can meet in a month or we can meet in two months, but if we meet in a month, we'll have time to review a draft of the questions. Right. Correct? Okay. Yeah, you won't have a ton of lead time uh, with a June meeting. I mean, we will work on getting questions crafted and out to you, but you know, they probably will not come to you in a week or two. They will probably come much closer to the meeting date. Okay. Whereas if it was in uh, July, you would obviously get a lot more lead time, but. Uh, I would probably vote for July, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm flexible. What do you guys think? Well, Earl, what do you think? Historically we've had meet or P and Z would have two meetings a month. And several years ago, we said we're going to just do it once a month, but reserved the uh, the option of having a second meeting, which then would be the fourth Tuesday. Okay, 
Well, yeah. So if, so if the second Tuesday doesn't work for Chris and might be crowding crowding us in terms of lead time, what about the fourth Tuesday, which would be June twenty third? Yeah. I second uh, Commissioner Wyman's motion. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Okay, I I'm okay with it. What about the rest of you guys? I'm fine with it. Yeah, okay. I agree. I'm okay. fine with the date, but I'm not certain about meeting in June um, at the town of city center or together. I think we, we're going to have to have a virtual meeting again because oh, I, I am assuming another virtual meeting. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. I, I would. I would also. And on that topic, would you guys? want to meet a little bit earlier if we do it virtually since nobody's doing any traveling yeah sure. yeah um yeah i thought it might be better for everybody's plans uh five or five thirty five i could go for five that works i could do five works on our end Is that how do you think chris i it's great i i think that that works well Okay. All right. Well, let's plan on that. Kathy, if Kathy does that thumbs up, thumbs down? Does that work? Oh, uh, you did. Do we need a vote? Um, wait, hold on just a second. Kathy is talking, but she is muted. Hello, Kathy. It is not with me. Top right hand here. corner. There Sorry. I, I, was, I was checking my schedule. Uh, CML's conference is typically that we're talking June 23rd. Yes. Right? CML's conference is typically on that date, but I heard that they had canceled it. They so. did. They did. Yeah. Cancel. Okay. Yeah. So I was just confirming that. So yes, it works for me. Sorry and, about that. And can I just say um, no motion for this meeting because it's a study session. Right. Correct. We'll, yeah. we'll just handle it. And wait now, what, in fact, what is the final date for this meeting? June 23rd, 5 p.m. Okay. June 23rd, 5 p.m. Done. Okay. Any other uh, comments, questions, or criticisms from Earl? <laughs> None for me. I'm good. You pick on Earl. None for me. Good meeting. Earl, Earl is large on my screen. That's why I'm picking on <laughs> Okay, well, listen, guys, I appreciate everybody's time. Chris, did you want to mention yeah. the webinar? Yeah, real quick. Um, so there is a, and I'm trying to pull it up, and I know, Laura, I think you're still on the call, um, that there is a webinar coming up. Let me find it here real quick. That yeah, you, the Highline Canal um, Conservancy sent out in a notice about a webinar regarding stormwater. Um, hosted by the That's EPA it. and the Conservancy staff. So we'll be putting that out on our social media through the city um, tomorrow. Um, and we can also forward it to y'all if you are interested. Yes. Um, let's see. Right. The Highland Canal Conservancy, along with Denver Water, Mile High Flood District, and local jurisdictions are working together to transition the Highland Canal into an inspiring model of green infrastructure for stormwater management. Um, and so I guess this webinar is just about about that project but we thought it might be a great way to give context for for you folks uh about you know what that what that could mean for the master plan definitely yeah great okay look forward so to getting will, that announcement yeah. we'll we'll send you an email oh, good. well thanks everybody with that i think we'll adjourn the meeting thank you thank, thank you all. thank you good to see you all you, have a good, good evening night.